Hi everyone, and welcome to Wildlife Wednesday Monthly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and it's our best of 2021 episode. We've got all of our favorite videos that we've been showing on this broadcast throughout 2021 to show you this evening. Now, my co-host Tyler can't be joining us this evening. He is off studying wolves in Yellowstone National Park, which is currently closed to the public, but he will be back with us next month, hopefully with some great stories and videos of some of the footage he took up there. In the meantime, let's go through all the different seasons of the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, starting with Laura talking a little bit about hunting foxes from March, 2021. Hey everyone, this is Laura. The winter season gives us a great opportunity to see red foxes in the greater Yellowstone area. Red fox, who are a relatively small mammal at about 10 to 12 pounds, stand up on top of the mid to late winter snowpack and become a lot more visible. Foxes might be out and about on top of our thick snowpack hunting for rodents, Sometimes we see a fox stop and tilt his head right to left to better hear or triangulate the sound of a rodent down beneath the snow. Then he might dig with his paws or if he's sure of the location of that rodent using the Earth's magnetic field, he might dive in head first with his tail wagging in the air to tackle or capture a rodent for a meal. For me, that's one of the most exciting things to see in the greater Yellowstone area, especially if that fox is successful. Fox walk really well on top of our thick snowpack. They've got extra fur between their toes to help support their body weight on top of the snow, almost like they're wearing natural snowshoes. That fur also helps to insulate their paws from the cold. Around here, fox are quite fluffy. They've got really nice, big, full tails, which they use to curl up in when they, when they bed down for a nap or for the night. Our North American red fox is a species that originated in the old world over in Europe. We think that our red fox of North America deviated genetically from the European fox about 400,000 years ago. So likely they, they crossed what was known as the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia over into North America a long time ago and then have been evolving uh, in isolation from those European foxes ever since. Contrary to their common name, red fox, our local foxes can be born in a variety of colors. Of course, we do have red or light red colored red foxes here, but we also have cross foxes, silver foxes, and the occasional black fox. Cross fox means a cross or combination of red and black coloration. Usually those individuals will have a, a cross of color right over their shoulder. Occasionally we do see silver or even black colored red foxes. They're still part of the same species, but they, they have what's called melanism or too much pigment in their fur, giving them that dark appearance as black as my jacket but the silver and black colored foxes that I've seen around here still maintain that little white tip on the end of their tail. Thanks, Laura. It's always a delight to see those foxes hunting out in the snow. All right, let's move forward a little bit into April and May of 2021 and talk a little bit about all the baby four-legged critters that are a welcome beautiful thing to see in the spring here in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. Hello wildlife watchers, this is Sarah Ernst coming to you from a patch of mule's ear wildflowers, a native wildflower of these parts. When I lead a trip, often people will ask, well, what's your favorite time of year for wildlife watching? And my answer is all year round because every time of year there is something amazing happening out there from the wolves of the winter, bears in early spring, the elk bugling in the fall, 
in June, definitely the highlight for me is the baby wildlife. We can see everything from 30 pound bison babies to the tiniest little baby weasels scurrying across the landscape. We're gonna talk a little bit about the wildlife that we've been seeing across Jackson Hole and Yellowstone over the last month and show you some of our favorite uh, scenes that we've had over the month. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the strategy each animal has when it comes to bringing your baby out into a dangerous wild world. The first hooved animal or ungulate that we see giving birth in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is the American bison. Much earlier than the rest of the hooved animals, we see our first bison calves on the ground sometimes as late as the last week of March or so. And then through April and May and into June, about 80% of the Yellowstone bison have May birthdays. We call them red dogs for their somewhat canine looking appearance and playful behavior. At around two and a half months old, they start shedding their orange fur. Uh, and around four months old, they're solid brown. With both bison and moose calves, they will begin to travel alongside their mother within a few hours of being born. In the case of bison, they will rejoin the herd. In the case of moose, they will travel uh, by their loner mother's side for the rest of the year and sometimes into the next year as well. Moose are one of the only big animals we see around here that will have twins on occasion. In Jackson Hole, that's about one out of every 20 moose will have twins. And imagine being pregnant with a moose calf with those long legs would be unpleasant enough during your last trimester with all that kicking. But being pregnant with twins and eight little legs kicking out in different directions uh, must be a lot for that moose mother to go through. While bison and moose are both large and aggressive enough to defend their young against predators, the smaller ungulates will prefer to hide their young the first week or two after giving birth, only coming back to nurse them a few times per day. Elk calves have a high predation rate. About two out of every three elk calves that are born are preyed upon by predators within the first year, including grizzly bears like 399, wolves, mountain lions, and even golden eagles. To help protect their young against predators, it's safest for the females to hide them until they're large and fast enough to travel with the herd. The elk calves have very little scent, and that does not travel very far as they tend to lay very low amongst the grass or sagebrush or willows. And they also have white spots that help camouflage them against the dappled background. Our smaller two members of the deer family, mule deer and white-tailed deer, will follow a similar strategy to the elk, having young with spots to help for camouflage and very little odor, and hiding them the first week or two after they're born. Many of us will sometimes encounter these fawns in our neighborhoods as deer are pretty successful at integrating themselves with human society today. It's very important to leave fawns alone when you find them, even if it looks like they're abandoned. Uh, the female will usually not approach if you're nearby and moving them will decrease the chance that the mother and fawn will be able to reunite. Pronghorn fawns are my very favorite to watch. Within a few days of being born, a pronghorn fawn can already outrun a human, so when they get a case of azumis, they can really tear it up. Pronghorn doe's uteruses are bicornate, kind of meaning heart-shaped, and in a human female, that can lead to reproductive problems. But in a pronghorn, it helps keep them balanced, having one baby in each corner. And because, like elk, they also have a fairly high predation rate on their young, it gives them a chance to have an heir and a spare, uh, another one to carry on the genes in case one gets taken out by predators. Mountain goat kids are about the same size as pronghorn fawns when they come out. But unlike pronghorn fawns, they're able to leap around the cliffs that they're born on just a few hours of being born and stay by their mother's side, similar to the bison and the moose. Also like bison and moose, the females are very aggressive in defending their young because they typically don't encounter many predators on the high cliffs that we see them on their whole lives. One of the only predators on mountain lion kids are eagles, which will occasionally knock a kid off of the cliffs where they're able to then go fly down and feed on it. 
All of these hooved animals are born from mid to late spring, partly to take advantage of the abundance of forage at that time of year, the new grasses coming out, the new leaves coming out on the trees, but also to overwhelm the predators with availability. If all the young were staggered out over the course of the summer, the predators would be able to pick them off one by one. But if all the hooved animals give birth at the same time, the predators can only eat so many when they're abundant. Thanks, Sarah. Next, let's check in to midsummer with guide Kelsey on her off day doing some climbing in the park. Hey, Eco Tours, it's Kelsey, uh, hanging out way up high above Cascade Canyon, doing what I love to do when I'm not guiding folks in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. I'm climbing. I'm here with uh, cameraman Cody, who is my climbing partner. And I just wanted to give you folks a view of stuff that you don't normally get to see when you're visiting Grand Teton National Park, unless, like me, you are a climber. So behind us, we've got the super, super snowy peak, which is Mount Owen. The triangle just behind that is the Grand Teton, the tallest one. And then this more prominent one that's closest to us is Mount Tiwanan. Now down in the canyon here, we can see Cascade Creek, which is leading out from Lake Solitude. And that creek is flowing all the way into Jenny Lake, which is what we are standing high above here in Cascade Canyon. Just wanted to give you folks a nice little view of what it's like way up high in the Tetons. Climbing is one of the big reasons people come to this park. Cody and I have already climbed probably about 400 feet or so. We're making our way to the summit of something called Tranquility Point. We've got about uh, two or 300 feet left to go. Uh, hopefully we make it back before the last Jenny Lake boat takes off. Anyway, it was uh, great showing you guys some of this and hope to see you out on tour soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Kelsey. We've moved through winter into early spring, and then it's time for one of my very, time, very favorite times of year, deep summer in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. One of our guides this summer, Charlotte, was also involved in a bird banding project in Grand Teton National Park with the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation. Let's go ahead and check in a little bit with her and learn more about bird banding from our August episode. Hey everyone, it's your Eco Tour Guide Charlotte here, and I'm about to talk to you all about some volunteer bird banding I've been able to do with the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation. Bird banding is an important tool to help gauge bird populations. In order to bird band, one must have a permit. Then these permitted bird banders go out and set up fine mist nets. The birds then fly into the nets without injury. After being caught, the bander comes by and carefully extracts the bird before taking them back to the banding table, where each bird is then given an individual uniquely numbered leg band that can be used to identify the bird should it be recaptured at the given site or another site at a later date. Once a bird is in hand, certain aspects are documented, such as morphometric measurements like wing length or tail length. The sex, age, and breeding status are also noted. Overall health, Feather wear and weight are also taken. So for this specific program, called Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship, or MAPS, banders go out once in a 10-day span over the summer months in the hopes of capturing and recapturing birds at a specific site. By doing this, banders gather data that helps scientists understand breeding status and survivorship of birds in a local area that when combined with data from other map stations across North America, many of which have been operating for years, gives rise to an understanding of bird populations, therefore helping scientists understand which species may be increasing or decreasing over time. Now here's Hillary Turner to tell you a little bit about the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation. Hi, I'm Hillary from the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation, where our mission is to advance wildlife conservation through science, collaboration, and a community of wonderful volunteers that we have. If you would like to support our programs, such as our map spanding station, please visit our website at jhwildlife.org. Thanks, Charlotte. And guys, I know Giving Tuesday is, uh, you know, yesterday, but if you're interested in supporting some of our amazing local nonprofits, 
uh, here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation is certainly a great example. You can find more great nonprofits specifically under the nature, wildlife, and conservation categories at Community Foundation of Jackson Hole for a great list of uh, great organizations that have been vetted and can certainly use your support. In the meantime, let's go ahead and talk a little more about August, the bison rut, which takes place in July and August. And the consequences of the bison rut, hint, it involves some really fun carnivores. Let's check in with Tyler. Uh, I know y'all miss him, but hopefully he'll be with us next month. In the meantime, here's his voice talking a little bit more about some really cool activity we saw in August in Yellowstone. It is the bison rut here in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. And all across the lowland valleys, great herds of bison have gathered together to challenge each other and for the males to start tending and fighting each other for the females. The bison do several different behaviors when or during the rut, including roaring demonstrated by this bull. These bison are all challenging each other. They're full of testosterone. They are rolling in the dirt and trying to intimidate each other. Inevitably, fights break out. And sometimes these fights can lead to injury or even death in some bison. Uh, bison weigh 2,000 pounds. They can easily move a vehicle. And so, you know, injury from bison fighting each other is actually pretty common and the predators are here to take advantage. And last week I was able to film and witness some wolves actually scavenging from a bison that was killed during the rut. Now the wolves scavenging from this kill are the Junction Butte Pack. One of the members of the Junction Butte pack that we actually witnessed scavenging from the bison kills was this wolf called uh, 1276. Uh, you can see she is radio colored, uh, but she wasn't the only wolf we saw coming in and scavenging from this bison kill. We also, also saw several yearlings. This is a yearling wolf here. You can tell from the longer hairs on the nape of this wolf. The Junction Butte Pack is one of the largest wolves ever recorded within Yellowstone, and recently over 30 of them were seen altogether traveling along the northern range of Yellowstone. Uh, this means that they need quite a bit of food, and especially with eight growing pups, they're going to need a constant supply of nutrition and food for those growing animals. And so a bison, especially a bison that they did not have to kill, is a very valuable source of food for these wolves. And so they are readily going to take advantage of this kill. They will likely feed upon the carcass for several days, as long as, as, long as another carnivore doesn't come in and steal it. Now, during the sighting, and look, this is, this is actually a video of 1276 again, and she's chewing on the bison hide. Now, actually, Later on in the week, we weren't there to film it, but bears did come down and investigate this carcass. Uh, but the junctions were able to hold on to it and utilize it as a food source for several days after the bison died. Now, during this sighting, the majority of the wolves that we saw were black. A large portion of the wolves in the Junction Butte pack are actually black in coloration. The alpha female is currently black. And that is a dominant trait, and so the wolves tend to be black in this pack. Now, we did have one gray wolf, this wolf, who's a female. Her her collar is, uh, or her ID number is 1228. She did come down and feed on the carcass as well. But a really amazing sighting and really, really thankful that we were able to see these wolves in action on a carcass. Awesome guys, really cool to see some of this amazing uh, views out of the Lamar Valley of Yellowstone, which is one of my favorite places on earth. Speaking of the Lamar Valley, we do have a few spots left 
on our winter multi-day programs, which is an extraordinary experience to get into the back country of Yellowstone National Park uh, in the wintertime, which is something very, very few people on the planet get a chance to do. I do want to play you a little bit of a video to show you a little bit more of what that's involved with. Do uh, take a look and see if that's of interest and let us know, either through email or giving our office a call, if that's something you'd like to be involved in. Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks in the winter are like nowhere else on earth. Join us this winter on an unforgettable journey into the depths of true wilderness on a multi-day adventure with Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures. Our eight-day winter in Wonderland and six-day wolves and wildlife programs will take you on an epic journey to see wildlife as you've never seen it before. Journey by snow coach into the depths of America's first national park, Yellowstone, to see its marvels dressed in snow, and then get an opportunity to see the wildlife that make it famous. Both opportunities will have a chance to see wolves and go in depth with the experts who study them. Get a chance to learn from researchers as you see wolves in the Lamar Valley, home to the densest population in the world. Our trips focus on viewing wolves in the deepest part of their breeding season to give you the best chance to see them in the wild in one of the wildest places on earth. To a witness an eruption of Old Faithful in the silence and stillness of winter is like no other experience. See Yellowstone when it's quiet and calm on our winter wonderland adventure with no crowds and walk through the geyser basins with an experienced guide who can show you the geothermal marvels that make this place so special. Spend a night amongst the geysers and travel to the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone to see spectacular waterfalls. Then travel down into Grand Teton National Park for great opportunities to see moose, elk, bison, river otters, and much, much more. When you go with Eco Tour Adventures, you go with the pros. Our trained naturalists and biologists know the best places to go to see the most wildlife, and our 4x4 vehicles and snow coaches will get you into the wild in comfort and safety. Each participant will have high quality optics and spotting scopes, and our pros know the perfect places for perfect photography opportunities. We hope you will join us in the wild this winter. Programs run throughout January and February. So give us a call or check out our website for more information on starting your adventure into Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks this winter. So if you've got any more questions about our winter multi-days, like I said, there's just a few spots left if you're interested. So I definitely look into it pretty soon here. Definitely uh, go ahead and take a look at our website, jacksonholeecotouradventures.com, or I think it's jhecotouradventures.com, or you can call our office, or you can send us an email at info at jhecotouradventures.com. All of those will tell you a little bit more about the different programs and those dates that they're taking off. In the meantime, let's get back to our favorites. Let's, since we have been spending a little bit more time in the winter, let's kind of get into the fall, edge our way into the winter season with a great look at grizzlies from Tyler. One of the most sought after animals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is the grizzly bear. These charismatic carnivores are not only the top predator of the ecosystem, but are some of the most interesting animals to observe in the wild. While on tour, we encountered many grizzlies this summer, and I want to recap on some of the familiar faces we have seen out in Grand Teton in Yellowstone. During October, bears begin to ramp up their activity. They have entered a phase called hyperphagia, a time when they need to consume over 10,000 calories a day to prepare for the upcoming winter hibernation. Most bears have also returned to the lowlands after spending the entire summer in the high alpine country. However, one bear that doesn't travel to the mountains is Grizzly Bear 399, and we enjoy seeing her throughout the summer. Grizzly Bear 399 is a 25-year-old sow who has generations of descendants. We often see 
her cubs and grand cubs out in Yellowstone and Grand Teton. One of her offsprings we see regularly is Grizzly Bear 610. She tends to be much more elusive than her mother and probably follows the annual bear migration up into the mountains. This spring, we did see her evict her two-year-old uh, male cubs, her two two-year-old male cubs, who set out on their own for the first time. Leaving their mother, these young bears face many challenges, both natural and unnatural. One of the offspring of Grizzly Bear 610 and a grand cub of Grizzly Bear 399 is Grizzly 926, a young adult female who appeared this spring with two koi or cub of the year. These cubs are the grandchildren of Grizzly Bear 399 and demonstrate how deeply this bear lineage runs. Grizzly Bear 926 has been seen throughout the summer and a couple of our guides actually got to see her on a bison carcass uh, earlier this month. This bear lineage, you know, the 399 lineage runs very deep. And to kind of demonstrate this, I made you guys a small family tree showing the different bears in the lineage that we observed this summer. The final member of this family tree is Grizzly Bear 963. She is a four-year-old female that emerged with her first cub ever this spring. That cub unfortunately did not survive, but she was able to mate again later in the season. Raising cubs is a great challenge for bears, and most of them fail in their first attempts. The lessons she learned trying to raise this first cub will be used later in life to successfully rear future offspring. Like I said before, raising cubs is very difficult, and only about 50% of cubs make it to their first birthday. One of the many challenges they face includes human interference. That is why we want to remind everyone to be responsible bear viewers out in the field, not to approach, feed, or habituate grizzlies, both for bear and human safety. While raising cubs to adulthood is often difficult, one bear we see regularly that seems to be pretty, pretty successful at it is the Lake Butte Sow. This bear has not been tagged like many of the bears in the Tetons, and so she has never received an official ID number. Many people call her Raspberry, but we prefer to use official names given to them by scientists and park personnel. That is why we call her the Lake Butte Sow. During the summer, she put on quite a show, killing several elk calves this spring and feeding on them with her one-year-old cub. She is often seen during the beginning and end of the summer months, and recently we saw her actually feeding with her cub in a snowstorm. The final bear we saw regularly this summer is the adult cub of the Lake Butte Sow. She's not received an official name yet, and so I commonly call her the Pelican Valley Sow while on tour. Last week on one of my last Yellowstone tours of the season, I watched this young grizzly feed on a road-killed elk. I'm excited to see what this bear's future holds and where she will end up in the future. Well, thanks everyone. It's been a truly amazing summer and we have had some pretty unforgettable grizzly sightings as well as sightings of a bunch of other amazing animals. My name is Tyler Greenlee and thanks everyone for tuning in. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tyler, for that great look at the grizzlies of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Okay, we've got time for one more video. And then after that, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got any questions for me, feel free to write them in the comment section. In the meantime, one of my favorite species of the Yellowstone ecosystem that I just adore is the pronghorn antelope. And they are a summer resident of Jackson Hole. They do migrate south. Uh, for the winter. The snows just get too deep here in the winter time. And so sadly, most of our pronghorn have left us for the winter. I won't see them until next spring. But let's look back on their rut, their breeding season, and check out what was going on back in October. Oh, hey guys, this is Laura. Get ready for some high speed action out here in Wyoming. It's the annual pronghorn rut. Pronghorn are our fastest land mammal in North America. They can do highway speeds between 55 to 60 miles an hour at a sprint. They were well adapted to get away from a, an animal called the American cheetah that went extinct at the last, the end of the last major ice age, approximately say 14 or 15,000 years ago. But pronghorn still have that type of speed, which they use during their rut to chase each other around. <laughs> 
the pronghorn rut isn't quite the knockdown, drag out brutality of the bison rut, but instead more like uh, a really intense game of catch me if you can or capture the flag, where bucks or males chase does around out in the sagebrush or in wide open meadows, trying to show off with their speed and their, their great posturing um, for females to select them to breed. Uh, a buck might accumulate a group of does during the rut, which is called a harem. That's really similar to the elk during their rut, where bull elk accumulate their harem of cows, which he's interested in, in mating with and will defend jealously through the fall. And even though pronghorn are not deer, we still refer to a male as a buck and a female as a doe. Actually, the closest relative to pronghorn worldwide is the African giraffe or okapi. Uh, we think that there were 11 similar species to pronghorn, um, but many of them have gone extinct, including three relative species that were in North America when early humans arrived, transitioning out of that last major ice age. It's relatively easy to tell male and female pronghorn apart. Uh, bucks typically have much larger size horns at about six to eight inches. They're a dark brown or black color, which hook or curve in towards the tops versus a female who has much smaller horns. Uh, her horns are still made out of keratin, but they're usually like half an inch to an inch long. And you know, you may or may not be able to see her horns from a distance. Bucks use those horns to show off. Of course, females are interested in bucks with large size horns, but he, he might also use those horns to fight uh, against another buck or maybe you know, rip up some vegetation or um, throw up some dirt. Uh, I love it when a pronghorn, you know, gets into it with a big sagebrush bush and ends up wearing it kind of like a hat. <laughs> I think that's really handsome. Um, so this pronghorn mating season or rut happens in the fall. About seven to eight months later, the pronghorn fawns are born in our spring, which is you know, early to mid-June. Um, their coat isn't quite as thick or as dense as some of our other ungulates, so they might be born a couple weeks later when warmer conditions arrive to the valley. Um, at about five days after being born, a pronghorn fawn can actually run away from a human. They're faster than us really quickly. <laughs> they grow up so fast. I have been lucky enough to actually witness pronghorn mating. Now, leading up to the, the pairing, uh, the, the buck actually um, you know, approached the doe subtly. He didn't chase. Um, the chase was over. I guess she was already dedicated to that one buck. <laughs> He showed off his preorbital gland by swapping his jawline right to left to, to display. He made some soft vocalizations before actually mounting that doe to breed, which I thought was a great moment. Love was in the air. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks, Laura. Great view of some pronghorn there, including an incredibly rare video of pronghorn breeding towards the end. All right, so that's our best of 2021 videos for you. Now it's time for uh, a couple different things. I do wanna talk about our big Black Friday sale, which is still ongoing in our web store. If you guys are curious, you can go to jhecotouradventures.com and check up uh, some of this great stuff that we've got available, uh, including one of my favorite things in the store, which is this brand new Yellowstone Wolves book from the big expert on the subject, Doug Smith, uh, who's been a real hero of mine over the years. So definitely worth checking that out. Yellowstone Atlas is amazing. Steoware, great photography for purchase by the guides, um, Teton cups and mugs and all sorts of great uh, winter hats have been a big seller this week. Uh, pillows, all sorts of things. Definitely check all of that out. And, uh, you know, 100% of the proceeds from our web store go to support our guides. So we definitely appreciate your support. In the meantime, if you want to support some of these guides without buying products, uh, we certainly love to bring this to you guys all perfectly for free. But we do have a tip jar on the website. And feel free to drop the guides a tip if you think um, that would be something you'd like to do. But 
Obviously, certainly totally optional, but we sure appreciate it. All right, time for my favorite part, uh, which is I'm here to answer your questions live. So if you've got uh, a question for me about the natural world, Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, um, try and stop me. See if I can't answer the question for you. Go ahead and ask it in the comment section. Um, I do have my iPad here, so if you guys are just totally baffled why I'm looking down, it's because I'm looking at your questions live, um, and I'll sort of get to them in the order they were received here. So we'll sort of see what we've got. Hang on one sec here. Let's see. All right. First of all, Pierre wanted to tell us that he's joining us from, I'm going to say it wrong, Alsace? Alsace, I think, uh, from France. So thanks so much, Pierre. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty long way away. I think he wins furthest away in terms of our live viewership this evening. We appreciate that for sure. Uh, Mark had an interesting question for me, which is, I heard an infrastructure bill was passed which earmarked millions for animal crossings and other improvements at national parks. What de details can you provide concerning Jackson Hole and Yellowstone? Mark, you are correct. That infrastructure bill was in the works for a really, really long time and uh, finally did pass. And that's a huge, huge deal for our national park system, which has a backlog of nearly 40 years of work that needs to get done. National parks are experiencing higher visitation than they ever have throughout um, the national park system, but particularly in places like Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park, which have become increasingly popular. And of course, I'm not surprised by that, but maybe some of you guys might be. In the meantime, that sort of thing takes time to trickle down. So what's going to happen is um, the bill was passed by Congress. Now that money is going to be allocated to the Department of the Interior. From there, the Department of Interior is going to allocate those funds to the National Park Service. National Park Service then um, it allocates those funds based on need. So basically, they have a bit of a triage system where the most dire infrastructure and development projects are addressed first, followed by the ones that are less dire, I suppose is the best way to put it. It took us approximately 40 years to get a new visitor center, for instance, here in Grand Teton National Park. Um, the old one was basically a double wide trailer. The new one is a beautiful thing and was mostly raised through private funds simply because the um, possibility of getting a visitor center any other way through congressional action seemed particularly unlikely. So we are excited about some of these wildlife crossing programs um, in many ways because so many of our animals migrate to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, even far more important than wildlife crossings inside the park are wildlife crossings in their migratory routes going across things like interstates and really important roads throughout Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. So we're definitely really interested in getting those funded as well. There's a great organization called Wildlife Tourism for Tomorrow, which EcoTours is a founding starter of, particularly our owner, Taylor Phillips, that's working really hard on wildlife crossings right now in Wyoming. So take a look at Wildlife Tourism for Tomorrow if you want to know a little bit more about that and you want to make a difference for some of those pronghorn and their migration, as well as mule deer, um, our elk population, and a lot of other species. In the meantime, nothing has been announced as to what's going to be built where, um, but certainly things like uh, endangered species like desert bighorn sheep in the desert southwest are going to have priority over animals that are doing relatively well, like, say, elk. So we'll see. Uh, and I'll keep you posted when we know more for sure. So great question there. Let's see here. Lessa had a great comment. She said, I'm sure the birds don't like being put head first in the cup to be weighed. Lessa, you are absolutely correct. They don't. But what's interesting is, is of all the things that we do when we handle birds for bird banding, um, which I used to do just a smidge of in my earlier years. And in fact, I was uh, involved with that exact same MAPS project when I was much younger. Um, the, the cup is a little bit like a hood. I don't know if you know what like falconers, they'll put a hood on the bird and it actually calms them because birds are very vision based animals. And when um, the hood is placed on them, they immediately have the sensation that they have gone to sleep. And so it just chills them out. So the reason that they kind of do that little PVC pipe um, on the scale is it is actually probably the calmest that bird will be during the entire bird banding process. Bird banding, of course, is not 
easy on the bird. It doesn't hurt them, but it certainly isn't probably the most enjoyable experience. But it's critically important for us to be able to keep track of our bird populations throughout the United States because they can be an indicator species of when things are going wrong. Um, as humans change our landscape, birds can be some of the first bellwethers of those changes, along with amphibians. It's very important to monitor them as well so that we understand um, what's going on in the Yellowstone ecosystem. We do want to keep track of these bird populations and how they change over the years, particularly as we begin to look towards things like climate change. So probably not a lot of fun for that flicker to go headfirst into that PVC pipe, um, but certainly wasn't going to hurt him. He probably didn't enjoy the um, well, probably minute, minute and a half experience that he went through in that bird banding process out of a very long lifespan. So you're right, but actually the weighing part was probably the least um, problematic for him. It was the most calming out of everything they did. Uh, all right, let's see here. Maddie's got a great question. Are elk being fed on the National Elk Refuge or NER this winter? Uh, Maddie, elk refuge uh, feeding is based on forage conditions. So basically the Wyoming Game and Fish Service gets together with the National Elk Refuge and they actually measure the available amount of grass and forage available for the elk. And they monitor that as snow falls and as the conditions change and as that forage becomes eaten, or as it becomes encased in ice, they begin to make decisions about supplemental feeding. We do know that clustering elk together for supplemental feeding causes an increase in different kinds of disease, including chronic wasting disease. And so the Elk Refuge is making an effort to um, have fewer days of feeding and draw down the overall amount of feeding that it's doing. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can go to the National Elk Refuge's Elk and Bison Management Plan and read a little bit more for yourself. But definitely a, a controversial kind of thing because the more they draw down feeding on the refuge, the more there is potential for the elk to move outside of the refuge, including into um, cattle fields and eat the hay that the ranchers raise for cattle. So there's a lot of debate, but uh, CWD, which of course can be um, transmitted to humans or theorized can be transmitted to humans from elk, uh, is of great concern. So definitely need to do some things for that elk herd as well. So great question. Appreciate that. Pamela, you've got a really good one. How big do wolf packs normally get? You mentioned the Junction Butte pack was around 30 wolves and that seems quite large. Pamela, you're right. That's huge. That is a gigantic pack. Um, it is the ba biggest pack in Yellowstone National Park's history. There was another pack, the Druid pack, which I think got to 28. And it got to 28 and sat on 28 for about, oh, 10 months or so before there was a great schism and the pack divided into two. In that particular case, uh, there was a, an alpha male who um, got into a disagreement with the beta male and they kind of went their separate ways and uh, sort of the blacktail plateau pack and then also the druid pack. Our anticipation is the Junction Butte Pack will have a similar situation happen relatively soon where there will either be a rivalry between the alpha male or the alpha female and some of those other pack members uh, and it'll cause a bit of a schism. But basically the reason that a pack would change in size would either be because there are not enough prey items within their territory to feed the pack or um, because they've had enough pups that the pack has grown too large uh, and is expanding their territory. And of course, expanding their territory in the territory of other wolves. And so it's kind of fascinating, but the biggest killer of wolves uh, historically are other wolves. When packs become too large, they have to expand their territory. When they expand their territory, they expand into the territory of other packs. And those packs, of course, are then going to go to war with the large pack and do some damage to their numbers. We haven't seen that yet, but we've certainly seen some inklings of that happening. Um, Tyler will have more information for us, hopefully about that in January, and he can tell you a little bit more about what's going on up there since he's actually studying those guys as we speak. Great question. Don is asking, have bears been going to denning later and emerging earlier than say 20 years ago? Is the, uh, the average denning time is how long? Don, that is a really, really good question. Um, and just recently there was a study that came out that actually concretely proved uh, what my suspicion had been, which is to say when I was a little girl, I certainly remember their denning being far longer than it is today. But understand that we're talking about a range of different bears, black bears versus grizzlies. And of course, we're talking about a range of ecosystems. So the first thing to understand about bears is they don't actually have to hibernate. 
Um, second thing to know about bears is they don't hibernate, they anestivate, but we, we don't need to get into that right now. We'll call it hibernation just for fun today, but understand that it's far more complicated than that and they're not actually hibernating. Uh, but I don't wanna get too much in the weeds here. Black bears in Florida, for instance, typically don't hibernate. If you think of winter as a time of famine rather than a time of cold, they're not hibernating because it's cold out. They're hibernating because it's hard to find food in the wintertime. So if you live in a ecosystem or an area that has plentiful food year round, there's no reason to hibernate. Florida bears don't hibernate. Zoo bears typically don't hibernate either because they're getting enough calories. When the amount of calories a bear is gaining is less than the calories it's expending, a hormone kind of switches on in their brain that makes them really sleepy and gives them the urge to den. When that hormone switches on has everything to do with when they're getting their calories, right? So um, male grizzly bears oftentimes will hibernate for a far shorter period of time than young female grizzly bears who are, for instance, pregnant. Um, black bears will hibernate for an even longer time than grizzly bears will for the simple expedient that it's easier for grizzly bears to steal carcasses from wolves and find food resources that black bears would find more difficult. So there's a whole range there, but the short version to think about it is females hibernate longer than males typically, although old females will sometimes be an exception, and black bears hibernate longer than grizzlies. The study that came out recently, I think it was also published in the New York Times as well, if you want to look this up, basically said for every degree increase in Celsius uh, that American black bears uh, experience and as the climate sort of warms, we see six fewer days of average hibernation. If you're going to average out all those black bear hibernation dates, you could probably extrapolate that grizzly bears are experiencing a similar shortening um, there's a couple other factors in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem that certainly are impacting this. We do have a fall elk hunting season. Um, when hunters hunt elk, they tend to leave the stuff in the woods that they, that's not meat that they don't want to take home. So the guts and the offal, so to speak. Um, grizzly bears think that's some of the most nutritious items uh, in an elk. They go for that first because of the fat content. So uh, Grizzly bears feeding on gut piles, particularly if the temperatures are cold and preserving those gut piles so they can be fed on longer, can keep them awake far, far longer. Um, grizzly bears like 399, you remember last year she didn't hibernate until January and then she was back up, um, I want to say in early April. Uh, that's because she had so many mouths to feed and she had so many calories she had to find for all of those cubs that she just stayed up and ate those gut piles um, and then, of course, was getting access to some human-produced food, which was definitely problematic. So uh, that can influence hibernation. If they can find a rich food source, that's going to definitely change how long that they are awake versus asleep. So hopefully that answers your question, Don. It's always great to have you join us. Let's see here. Alton just said, I just looked it up. A pronghorn can do 61 miles an hour. Alton, this is one of my favorite statistics. You are right, and you're also incredibly wrong. Um, yeah, so most people will tell you that a cheetah can run 66 miles an hour. You want to know how they found that out? Back in the 1960s, they took a half of uh, antelope, I think, and they tied it up to the back of a Land Rover, and they had sort of a semi-tame cheetah who they taught to come for food. And they gunned the Land Rover and dragged the antelope behind the Land Rover and had the cheetah chase the Land Rover. And the highest speed that the Land Rover could go was 66 miles an hour. And the cheetah easily caught it. So they said, okay, therefore, uh, cheetahs go 66 miles an hour. Um, that is the worst piece of science I've basically ever heard in my life. Um, that's not a great way to indicate speed. Cheetahs can actually go far faster than that. We know cheetahs can probably get into the 70s, but we don't actually know how fast they can go because when cheetahs run, they don't run in a straight line. And it's very difficult to measure speed if it's not being done in a straight line. You can't just point a speed gun at something that's zigzagging um, as it's running full bore. So we don't really know, but probably the low 70s, maybe even the mid 70s, depending on who you want to be arguing with and what study you want to read. Pronghorn are the fastest land animals in North America, and they're probably the second fastest land animals on the planet. And historically, that same um, idea has been put towards measuring the speed of pronghorn, which is to say it's incredibly difficult. And you'll hear anywhere from 61 to 66 miles an hour for a pronghorn. But there is some good evidence out there that pronghorn 
can go faster than that. They could be 61, they could be 66, or they could even be in the low 70s, which argues, of course, what is the fastest land animal on the planet? Probably still is the cheetah, but there's a chance it could be pronghorn. And remember, of course, pronghorn evolved to outrun ancient North American prehistoric cheetahs. So um, their speed comes to them honestly, certainly. I personally got in a race with a pronghorn many, many years ago. Um, and I was driving a very old uh, Suburban early, early in the morning in the fall. And young pronghorn will sometimes race cars during the breeding season, during the rut, uh, when they're all amped up and they're trying to sort of prove themselves. And this pronghorn began running alongside of me. And so I sped up and he sped up and I sped up and he sped up. And this went on for probably like, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds. And then I floored it. And the fastest the car would go was 66, of course, miles an hour. That pronghorn paced me for a little bit at that 66 miles an hour. Then he looked over at me and he took off like I wasn't even moving, went way faster than I can. The best way to describe it is, is if you're like on the interstate and some guy in a Ducati motorcycle goes whizzing by you and you're going the speed limit, well, how much faster was that guy in the motorcycle going? Hard to judge, but he was definitely going faster than you were. Um, there's all sorts of stories like this all the time about pronghorn, you know, that have raced cars. The problem is, of course, is that that speedometer I was using was very old and not calibrated, and that can't be used as hard evidence of speed. But certainly, you know, a little side note that they're probably faster than 61, hard to know how much faster. But then again, cheetahs are probably faster than 66, hard to know how much faster. Hopefully that answers that question for you. Don has another question. Before it became a national park, did domestic cattle ever graze there? Yes, Don. Most of Grand Teton National Park was grazed in some way or form by early homesteaders. And then John D. Rockefeller Jr. created some land companies that didn't appear to be affiliated with him and quietly bought up the vast majority of the valley floor to create Grand Teton National Park. Now, the mountains and the lakes at their bases had been turned into a national monument, Jackson Hole National Monument, back in 1929. That area was not grazed, but the valley floor, much of it was, and we do have a lot of invasive grass species in the park as, as a result, as well as some hand-dug ditches by early settlers, which is a pretty impressive thing to see when you're out there. So great question. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that. Let's see what else we've got here. Hang on. Pamela asks, what is the latest on 399? Pamela, I have very little news, which is good news. She has been in Grand Teton National Park and staying there uh, for the last week or two. Uh, for those of you guys that are behind the times with the 399 drama, because it's always drama with her, she is one of the oldest grizzly bears uh, in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, and she has four cubs, and she has been... Um, causing grave concern as she's moved out of Grand Teton National Park into the southern end of the valley where the town of Jackson, agricultural fields, all sorts of things are, getting into um, apiaries, to bees, getting into grain storage, getting into chicken coops, um, actions that under normal circumstances they would probably consider euthanizing a grizzly, but she's so famous and she is so beloved that they certainly don't feel like that's a possibility with her, and of course they wouldn't want the cubs to not survive either. So she has... Um, an escort now. They went ahead and they collared two of the cubs, which was a little bit of a controversial situation in and of itself, but they've got two of those, cub those cubs collared so they can keep a better eye on where they are, and they have two officials from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because of course grizzlies are a threatened species and protected by the federal government, actually escorting her and keeping track of her and uh, moving her with hazing when necessary away from some of these human use areas where she's been getting into trouble. So she's decided to go back into Grand Teton and munch on those elk hunt gut piles, which is great news. That's exactly where she should be and what she should be doing and that keeps her safe. So hopefully teaching those cubs some good behaviors instead of some bad behaviors that could get them euthanized in the future if they got too aggressive towards people in human areas, which is a great concern. She should hibernate, hopefully soon. Of course, remember last year when I said that around this time, she didn't do it till January. So uh, we'll see. But the good news is very few people have been seeing her. Very few people have witnessed much activity. She's been kind of squirreling her way uh, into hiding in Grand Teton. And that's exactly what's in her best interest right now. So there you go. There's your 399 update. 
Alton asks, why would they put a collar on one of 399's Cubs and not on 399? The Cubs are going to go off on their own scene. Alton, that is a really good question. The answer is because 399 is trap shy. So uh, normally when you collar a grizzly bear, uh, you, you put out what's called a culvert trap for grizzly bears, polar bears, some of the larger species of bear. And it's... Um, it's based on a culvert drain pipe. Think a big, round, huge pipe that's got a grate on one end and then it's got a, a trap door on the other end. And then you bait the trap with something delicious um, that would uh, make the bear follow his nose into the enclosed space. And then when they attempt to eat that, the trap door closes. Um, from there, it's relatively easy to be able to sedate the bear sort of through the ends of the grate into their muscle tissue and be able to collar them in a way that's safe for the bears and for the um, bear managers. 399 has been trapped many, many times. And so what happens to old bears is they are so much smarter than the average bear, uh, to use a, a jellystone term. Uh, and they know what these culvert traps are and they avoid them. They're not fools. Uh, bears have what they call near human intelligence or higher order cognitive thinking Think of them as having the intelligence of between a three and four year old child and you're not too far off the mark in terms of what we think of as human intelligence. They have certain, uh, they have actually accelerated emotional intelligence for instance, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, they um, put out five culvert traps and unsurprisingly, <laughs> Grizzly Bear 399 wasn't getting anywhere near that. But the cubs, they don't know it. They've never seen a culvert trap before. So three of them did enter the culvert traps. They slammed shut. And uh, 399 and the last cub ran away. And so there was a lot of concern for a while there because 399 and that cub had left the area that the family had been separated as part of this. Um, one cub didn't fully get sedated. So um, sedating bears is incredibly complex and complicated, but uh, they have a really, really high metabolism. And sometimes the sedation doesn't take very well. They can be very resistant to a lot of different anesthetic drugs. So only two of the cubs got knocked out. They both got collars. And the third cub, which wasn't fully anesthetized, they waited for all three to recover, released them, and were really, really lucky. 399 chose to come back to the area and return the next day for her cubs, which there was definitely some concern that she wouldn't and those cubs would be on their own real testament to the fact that she's such a good mother that she chose to come back for them then from there this was south of the town of jackson uh they went ahead and and headed north they went right through the center of town uh, about a block off of the square and then got hazed back into grand teton national park so hopefully that answers your question let's see here Oh, this is a great question. Knowing that moose numbers are going down, are there any programs effectively supporting them? That is a really, really good question. And moose numbers going down is really complicated. It's happening very quickly. It's happening throughout uh, the continental United States. And there are some mysteries as to what's going on. So uh, moose numbers are going down in Maine. They're going down in Minnesota. They're going down in Wyoming and Montana. We are seeing... Uh, real problems with moose populations throughout the United States, but they seem to be going down for different reasons in different places. So for instance, in Maine, they're seeing uh, tick loads in excess of the thousands on baby moose, and they're literally just getting sucked dry by these ticks. That's not something they've had a problem with before. So what's puzzling about that is why all of a sudden have they been vulnerable to ticks when they weren't uh, previously? That, that's sort of a sign of maybe a weakened immune system, or it could be a sign of climate change and the ticks are thriving and surviving in places that historically it got too cold and, and froze larvae in the winter and tick populations remained low. We, we have almost uh, no ticks here in Jackson Hole, but we have a growing tick problem here in the valley, uh, which actually the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation is studying with moose. Um, there's also a, um, there seems to be more liver flukes in moose than there used to be. Um, although it's hard because of course you need a baseline study to see if something has increased and um, sedating moose and looking at their livers historically wasn't something that sedating shooting moose and looking at their livers wasn't something historically that scientists were doing with hunter killed moose. So uh, there seems to be more liver flukes, but hard to know. Uh, that could be as a result of 
uh, growing livestock on the landscape, or once again, it could be, again, changing diets or climate change that could be contributing to that. Um, here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, moose populations are plummeting. When I was a little girl, we had nearly 2,000 moose in the region. Now we have less than 150 uh, in Jackson Hole. So huge declines, but it's complicated because we're not really sure how many moose were here prior to human settlement. Um, it was only after the near extermination of species like elk that probably allowed moose to thrive here. That's not to say there weren't moose in the valley. Uh, probably those moose numbers were really pretty low compared to what's been around in the modern day. As elk populations have recovered, moose populations have declined, but it's also probably not that simple once again. Um, as elk populations exceeded wildly out of control and became too high for the ecosystem, moose populations didn't decline accordingly uh, in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, we had plenty of moose and we had plenty of elk. Uh, and now we're starting to see um, efforts to try to control that elk population, but now we're seeing moose populations crash. And if we were, if it was just a matter of there were too many elk and they're eating all the same forage as moose and the moose are starving to death, then we would see some recovery effort from moose. Um, human impacts on moose continue to remain high. The Teton Village uh, Highway 390 has more moose hits than just about anywhere else in the United States every year. Um, we lose about 10 to 15 to even 20 moose on that road every year, which if you consider there's only around 150 in Jackson Hole, that's pretty unsustainable. Um, as for what's being done about all of this, Wyoming Game and Fish is pretty baffled. You know, they're in charge of the moose of the state and they're not really sure how many moose there should be. Uh, and they're not really sure what's causing the decline of the moose. Um, and so they aren't really sure exactly what to do about it. One thing I do want to point out is oftentimes folks who don't like wolves will immediately say, oh, well, the only thing that's changed, the only variable is we've added wolves to the situation. And, and it's because we have wolves that we are losing our moose. And, and um, that can be a little deceiving because my first answer to you is, yes, actually, in the last decade, wolves have started killing more moose than they historically did. Um, but when you consider that they were killing about one moose a year and now they're killing three to five, uh, it's not as much as you might think. Generally speaking, wolves will seek out the weakest, easiest to catch thing in an ecosystem. And 98% of that time, that diet is elk calf. That's what they mostly eat. What's going on now is they're finding that moose are the weakest, easiest catch to catch thing um, in their territories where historically they were strong, tough animals that they didn't stand a chance against and so didn't hunt. Wolves respond to disturbance and changes on the landscape. They're not the cause or change uh, of the change. They just respond to the change. So wolves are killing more moose because moose are weaker than they used to be. Why moose are weaker than they used to be? There's ongoing research and science to try and figure that out. Once we have an idea of what's going on, we can have some um, solutions that can be proposed to try to do something, but certainly of concern for sure. So great question. Let's see here. <laughs> Don says, a turkey one day before Thanksgiving can outrun anything on earth. Don, I love it. You're absolutely correct about that for sure. All right, guys, I've talked even a little longer than I planned to. Thought we'd go for about an hour. We've gone a little bit over. I think I got to everybody's questions. If you um, have a question that you asked and for some reason I missed it, I'll certainly get to it in the comments section. I do hope everybody has a wonderful holiday season and that you all get the opportunity to get outside a little bit. Um, you have a wild, wild month. We certainly look forward to the great opportunities that we have to spend with you all uh, this, this, this entire year. It's been just a joy. And uh, we do want to thank you for your continued support of us and this broadcast. Our very, very best wishes to you all. Here's to a really wonderful 2022. Uh, and in the meantime, I look forward to seeing you guys again in January. Our best wishes. So long.